this darkened hour gather we to hear the story how our Jesus held us near. Arrested, tried, so steadily he went. The sentence, death, though he was innocent. Now turn your gaze to where you hear his cries and watch our Savior hoisted to the skies upon an instrument to torture men. Our Jesus suffered, died to cancel sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself.
high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon stood warming himself, he was asked, You aren't one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. We have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. 
Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews Insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, 
which in Aramaic is Gabbatha, was the day of preparation of Passover, week about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Isaiah the prophet. O Lord Jesus Christ, surely you have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed you stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Lord, we give you heartfelt thanks for knowing our griefs and sorrows. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were crushed for our iniquities. Upon you was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with your stripes we are healed. Lord, we ask you to continually forgive our sins and be our physician in the face of all illness and injury. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way. And the Lord has laid on you the iniquity of us all. Lord, Lord when, when we stray from, from your word of grace and, and wisdom, restore, restore us to your, your eternal fold. You were oppressed and you were afflicted, yet you opened not your mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so you opened not your mouth. Lord, we praise you for being the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By oppression and judgment you were taken away. And as for your generation, who considered that you were cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of his people. Lord, we give you thanks for confronting and conquering grim death, descending into hell, and forever vanquishing the powers of Satan. They made your grave with the wicked and with a rich man in your death, although you had done no violence and there was no deceit in your mouth. Lord, keep us mindful of your pure innocence, and by your Spirit may we be ambassadors of your peace and truth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush you, he has put you to grief. When your soul made an offering for sin, he saw his offspring. He shall prolong your days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in your hand. Lord, Lord you, you have, have forsaken, forsaken your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord, that, that we may prosper in this life. Increase, increase our, our joy, knowing, knowing that, that our redemption is secure in the life and death, and death of Jesus. Jesus. Out of the anguish of your soul he saw and was satisfied. 
By your knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, made many to be accounted righteous, and you bore their iniquities. Lord, Lord may, may your righteousness be made known through our actions and our speech. Cleanse us from all iniquity, that we may purposely seek to do your will among all people. Therefore, he will divide you a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because you poured out your soul to death and were numbered with the transgressors. Yet you bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Lord, Lord continue, continue to intercede on our behalf, behalf that, our that our unknown transgressions and unmet needs may be embraced by the care and compassion of God our Father. In your holy, precious name, amen. amen. handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written I have written. soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, 
here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled Jesus said I am thirsty a jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked a sponge on it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips when he had received the drink Jesus said it is finished with that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. There's no sense in being cold. Today our focus is the cross. Even our time in which we are meeting for our worship is about honoring the time when Jesus, our Lord, yielding up his life to God and death. And yet in all of our worship gatherings, in our memory of faith, our sacraments, our proclamation, we are always about proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. But the regularity with which we appeal to the cross should not nor should ever distract us from how utterly unique or even ridiculous and foolish the cross is, and how utterly foolish it seems that we call today Good Friday. And so we are meant to ask, why? Why was Jesus, our Lord, subjected to shame, to scorn, rejection, to scourgings, to nails, to suffocation, and to death? Why should the one that many, just a few days prior in his ministry, declaring him to be their king, as they hailed him with palm branches and cries for mercy and salvation, be the same ones 
that handed him over to the authorities to be hung like a billboard on the side of the road advertising his own failure and rejection. Why? One of the mysteries of our faith is that we even have the grounds to ask this and expect an answer. We ask the question because it's a historical one on one level. It's concrete. Therefore, it's subject to our questions and investigations. Jesus was born under Herod the Great, under Caesar Augustus even. He had a ministry that began with the baptism of John at the Jordan, that prophet of Israel. His ministry itself was under Tiberius Caesar and his execution under Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And so when we ask why, it's because we are not dealing with a myth, but we are speaking of a man. A man in our own world, in our own history, who lived among other men and women, who did things and were affected by Jesus and vice versa. And it is in this landscape that Jesus himself conducted a ministry proclaiming the reign of God in a world of other powerful claims to what authority and heavenly rule should look like. And so it's easy then to begin our answer to why Jesus went to the cross like this. Well, Jesus went to the cross because he was a threat, a threat to Roman rule. He was a threat to the religious authorities of Jerusalem. And the Bible doesn't deny these answers. In fact, it confirms these reasons. The priests and the Pharisees were jealous and envious of the followers of Jesus as he gained them when he raised Lazarus from the dead, as he fed thousands and healed the sick and forgave sins. They saw Jesus as one who would bring down the wrath of Rome upon a whole people if he became too popular. As Caiaphas, the high priest, ironically prophesied, it's better for one man to die than for the whole people to be destroyed. And they saw something in Jesus as, as someone attempting to take away their authority by claiming to have authority over the Sabbath, authority over forgiveness of sins, the temple, and even to be the authority over Torah. All of this amounted in their understanding to a claim to kingship, a kingship which didn't look right to them, in a kingship that Rome was not willing to take a chance with. And so they rejected and killed him. And all of this makes sense on the playing field of history. But as important and legitimate as this answer is, it is at best only a starting point for us who are invited to come and see and ask deeper questions of why. As we look at Jesus and all his words and activities in the world, our world, our history, we see Jesus spending his ministry re resisting the framework of relating himself and the kingdom he was proclaiming either to Roman antipathy or those misguided Jewish expectations and ideas. Instead, he, time and time again, related himself and his vision of kingship, not to us, but to God. In other words, in Jesus, God was embodied and acting in our world, in our history, in a new way. All that Jesus did and said was as the king who is the son of the father. To ask the question, why did Jesus go to the cross, fails any lasting meaning if we only ask why in relationship to the Jewish leaders or the Romans or even to J Jesus' disciples or even to ourselves. This was about what God was up to. It was about God's time and God's space and God's intentions mysteriously invading our own that defies any word of explanation except for the word that Jesus himself gives. The word that God 
himself gives. Jesus himself, as he moved from the Mount of Transfiguration, he put his face towards Jerusalem and he predicted again and again the necessity of his own death as he gave his disciples one last Passover meal in light of the mystery of his upcoming death, as he agonized in the garden in one final temptation, in all of these things, Jesus himself was relating intimately to God as a son, as the embodiment of who God is in the world, so that the cross can only be appropriately seen in light of what God says. And yet, as he hung upon the cross, as Jesus continued to relate himself and his mission upon the cross to his Father, as he called down upon his executioners the forgiveness of their sins, even as he gave up his own life to his Father with his dying breath, the real question, the question which centers our meditation upon how mysterious God's plan is, comes from Jesus myself, or Jesus himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is where the open questions of history give way to the mystery of God's gospel for you and for me. Jesus upon the cross in full unity with the Father, full unity of the divine essence, unity of intention and will, unity of love for you and for me, became forsaken, truly forsaken, alone, isolated, even isolated from the other dying criminals who mocked him as a sinner in a league of his own, physically naked and broken, socially naked, spiritually naked. Jesus was condemned by his own world, as the most heinous of sinners and blasphemers and dangerous rebels. And God the Father himself remained silent to contradict. The mystery of the cross, of God's plan in Jesus who willingly took on his cross and laid down his own life is contemplated in the true and utter forsakenness that he experienced there. It's easy to feel forsaken, to feel alone, to feel naked and abandoned. And we don't make light of this. It's the world's brokenness, the physical brokenness, even as we are subject to feeling this separation from one another and even from God. There are those among us, even as Christians, who struggle with depression, with mental anguish, with feelings of shame, of only being seen according to the ugliness of their own twisted self-perceptions and so feel forsaken. There are those among us dealing with the physical brokenness of illness and death who can't help but feel tempted to scream out into the darkness, How long, O Lord? Why have you forsaken me? They feel forsaken. There are those who through their own sins or the sins of others that have their social world torn apart through divorce, through addictions, through the falling out of friendships and family members, and all of these things, we feel forsaken. And God does not make light of these realities of brokenness due to sin's corruption in the world and in our lives. God gives us the voice of lament, with the psalmists and the saints. He gives us the groans of the spirit that are too deep and exhausted for world words and rational articulation. He gives us words in Jesus' own lament. And Jesus himself meets us in all of those things on the cross, physically broken, socially rejected, shamed, and mentally and spiritually in anguish. But it isn't about solidarity, which is why Jesus is forsaken. It isn't just for a hug and a pat on the back to say, I am here for you, and that's why I go to the cross. 
That would be noble, maybe, an act of love to be sure, but it wouldn't fix anything. It wouldn't fix the brokenness of the world nor the judgment of condemnation that put Jesus on a cursed tree. By going to the cross, Jesus meets us at the level of all of our personal and individual histories with its brokenness, but brings with him God's history and God's plan to bear. A redemptive plan, a plan of love. With Jesus on the cross, we can no longer evaluate our world any longer without considering God's true dealings with us in this radical intrusion of love through Jesus who hangs on the cross. In light of the cross, we see a great mystery prompted by Jesus' derelict cry. Jesus uniquely experienced what no one else truly ever has, forsakenness by God. Even with the full reality of our physical, spiritual, and social brokenness of sin, God has not left us naked or abandoned. Just hours before Jesus hung on the cross, he had a meal with his disciples. A meal for one last word of what he was about to endure. And he, this meal was all about the Passover. That time in history, once again, where God worked powerfully to redeem his people. And in this meal, he had left a lamb to be forsaken so that others would be redeemed. There at the meal, Jesus declared, this is my body, which is given for you. And this is my blood shed for the new covenant. Jesus as the lamb forsaken by God to let sin and evil do its worst upon him, to let God's righteous word of condemnation do its worst on him, took our place as his blood stained the wood of the cross like the blood smeared on the lintel. Forsaken and abandoned, so that you would not be without God. Forsaken so that you would be forgiven. Now at the cross, the tension of distance from God and judgment and his love, which nevertheless covers and protects and love, comes fully together as Jesus hangs forsaken as that lamb that Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by letting sin do its worst so that it stands exposed and powerless in light of God's love. In God's forbearance, his patience, God has covered all of us and our sins in his mercy. Mercy. He has clothed us with his promises, but at the cross, sin finally hangs exposed. The sin that Jesus himself took upon himself as he soaked it up in the waters of the Jordan in his baptism, clothing himself in our sin, that sin may have nowhere to hide in the forsakenness of the cross. There is no covering for Jesus upon the cross. There is no consolation, no hope, no word of promise for the hereafter. There is only the exposure of sin, mine and yours, left upon the cross with Jesus' dying body. God sent forth his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, taking on the full burden and consequences of our sin and left it uncovered and naked on the cross. God's mercy and love is most clearly expressed as forgiveness because Jesus was forsaken so that our sin is forsaken and passed over that we might know a king in a kingdom of righteousness. 
Jesus' question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The question of why expressed in the deep mystery of God's love and action of Jesus' deep connection to his Father, a unity of love so powerful to even endure true forsakenness for you and for me. This is a question where we see the answer. Jesus is forsaken so that you may be forgiven. Amen. was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. 
He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 